everyone, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 8 of History's Greatest Idiots, the show where we go back through all of human history and analyze some of the biggest mistakes ever made by crazy, silly, stupid people and give you lessons from those mistakes so you never repeat them again. But who are we kidding? We're humans. Mistakes are part of our makeup and they are fodder for us. So hooray for mistakes. Um, joining me as ever is my amazing co-host, Derek. Derek, how are you doing, my man? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. It feels like it's it's been a while. How are it, you doing? It's been a while. Uh, <laughs> it, ha it has been a while. And actually, that's partially my mistake because I put the last episode out early. I put, instead of doing a Patreon post on the Friday, I put the episode out on Friday instead of like Sunday or Monday. So, hey, extra early Easter treats for the uh, the listeners. But um, yeah, I heard that they liked it. That's what I heard. A lot of people are saying... <laughs> That it was a it was a huge hit. It was. <laughs> it was. Um, that was a that was a. I had a lot of fun doing that episode with you. I think because we got to kind of. Are we in that? How how many seconds are we in? I can swear now. We got to shoot the shit. Yeah. Um, and I like doing that. Um, I, I like talking to you about random stuff because we we have fun tangents, and I really really appreciate that. So I, I appreciate them. A lot. Like I, yeah. I enjoyed the format and the way that we just kind of rolled with that one. And you going first was 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 fun for me. It was different. <laughs> yeah. It kind of um, we told stories. We can we can always uh, switch it up again today because actually mine is super conversational. If okay. uh, if you want, yeah, we can do that. Uh, oh, um, before I get going, I mentioned Patreon and one of our wonderful um, patrons is here, Kimberly Bright Eyes. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I want to give a big shout out. I, I, I did not prepare yet again for this eventuality, but um, I would like to give a shout out to our original patrons. Um, so obviously, Kimberly is uh, one of our patrons, along with um, our OG patron. Um, where are you? Jesse Chris, right down there at the bottom. Yeah, Jesse Chris. Jesse, thank you so much. Um, Andrew Zavara, thank you so much. Dilly Bob, thank you so much. And we have a bunch of free uh, followers as well. Thank you all so much. If you would like to join them and uh, give us a little bit of money and get some behind the scenes uh, footage, videos, pictures from our holidays, scripts from the episode, along with... Um, patron exclusive gifts that you will get when you sign up and as you become a yearly member along with patron exclusive um, recordings that we do every single month go to patreon.com slash history's greatest idiots so you can join up there and uh, if you want to kind of stay in touch with us we're not super active on social media because we're both busy boys but if you want to follow <laughs> us on instagram go to at history's greatest idiots on instagram and we're there we're not on twitter twitter anymore because fuck twitter yes so. Fuck whatever X. it's called whatever it is it doesn't matter <laughs> i saw um, somebody was doing a little study on it to see what oh, if, yeah. it, if it had a home page because they don't let you see what stuff is if you're not a member now but if it That's had right. a home page it would be super racist and horrible so if you start a new one <laughs> and check it out and like just click on like one or two of the long things your for you page will turn out horrible and evil i remember allegedly yeah allegedly <laughs> i remember when i signed up for I don't think it was truth social, but it was like truth social adjacent social media. Uh, what was that thing called? I, I know what you're talking about and I can't like remember it. Alt right social media thing. Um, and the suggestions were like, um, th for you, you might be interested in following this person, Donald Trump. And then just like a series of like um, Milo Yiannopoulos, fucking George Santos, just like a series of really quite awful people um, in terms of the way they've discussed topics and, and issues and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, this is like a cauldron of hate, this whole yeah. thing. It wants you screaming at the screen straight away. Um, really, really messed up. So I'm, I'm glad I'm not on Twitter anymore because apparently it's becoming that. Also, big hi to Aloysius O'Hare. Uh, thank you name. so much for joining. Coolest name. I feel like you've been here before. So really great. Good to have you on board. Um, Derek, we've we've had a bunch of stuff happen recently. Um, you went on like a whole cool boat trip thing. 
Am I right in thinking that? Yeah. Yeah, we we went on a trip out to Lake Havasu, which we, I nice. hadn't been in forever since I was a kid. My wife and I, neither one of us had been there since we were kids. And then we went out on a boat with our friends, and I thought we were just kicking it on the lake. And apparently you can travel on yeah. boats. Uh, Grown-up me didn't know this, but uh, yeah, you can travel. We traveled all the way up to like Needles, California, to a place called Pirate Cove. It was pretty neat. That's so um, cool. Yeah. Did you get to did you get to start talking? Did they did they talk like that? Was it themed? Uh, Are you becoming nice this far up the river and stuff like that? I don't know. We we didn't actually stop there. We just kind of cruised around. Oh. There was a pirate ship. Um, I plan on spending more time there the next time I go. So it was nice. cool enough that there's gonna be a next time. That is true. And actually having that option, like, oh my god, I can go on this adventure again. Love it. Like as an adult, when you find out that you could do cool stuff again, you're like, really? I get to do this fun thing again. I get to have joy <laughs> in my life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, Niels, to you. Hello, guys. Finally caught you guys live. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to have you all here. Uh, really wonderful. Uh, last recording, I think, caught people a bit off guard, and it was just us talking. But um, we've got kind of um, slightly different format for you today. I've got a very short one, but I think it's going to spark quite a bit of conversation between everyone here, myself, Derek. So if it's okay with you, Derek, I'd like to go first. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and again, I was looking for topics and I was really kind of, like, who do I pick? Do I go with this? Do I go with that? And I was like, I, I just, I actually spoke to um, Laurel Rockle from um, Hightailing Through History. And okay. she was like, because uh, we were talking like, how's the podcast going? How's life going? We're just catching up. And um, she was like, who are you thinking of covering? And I was like, I'm thinking of covering this person. She was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I was like, oh, okay, that's all the affirmation I need. Really, like that, If she, <laughs> she found it cool, I'm like, yeah, that's that's good enough for me. I'll, I'll take that one. So I want to tell you the story. Actually, sorry, before we get going, <laughs> I want to give a big shout out to the uh, Familiar Wilsons uh, media and Familiar Wilsons podcast. I met Josh Wilson in London. A week ago, just had the greatest time. That guy is just the most amazing person. Thank you for hanging out with me, Josh. If you're listening to this, you're amazing. It was awesome hanging out with you. And we had Cuban food. Never had Cuban food before. Tastiest thing I've had in months. Oh, my God. It's so good. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> tangent over. Uh, let me go back to my guy. Let me tell you the story. And it's not a big famous person, this guy. But okay. you will find out why. I'm covering him shortly. William Henry Miller, secretive and kind of odd, even by 18th century standards, okay. to be honest. Yeah. Um, I also want to give credit for this. Um, it's kind of taken from three sources. Wikipedia, obviously, because I'm lazy, uh, but also <laughs> <laughs> from the I newspaper, from an article published in 2017 called The Peculiar Life and Mysterious Death of Edinburgh's William Henry Miller by Jack Gillen. That's for the I newspaper. You can find that online. And also um, Edinburgh Live, um, which is like another newspaper. You can find that, uh, another article on there for this as well. But I've pulled from all these sources because William Hen Henry Miller has kind of like a very truncated life. It's just some parts of it are so weird that you kind of have to discuss them. So okay, <laughs> that now. Um, despite living in the public eye, as an MP, Edinburgh man William Henry Miller was a peculiar character who was even stranger in death than he was in life. So that's an interesting way to do it. That's a great way to start an article. Props to Jack Gillen for that one, because when I read that, I was like, I'm going to enjoy reading this. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going to be a fucking zombie or something. Not quite. <laughs> So William Henry Miller was born in 1789, the only child of William Miller, a rich and independent nursery man. I don't really know what a nursery man is. Like, like children nursery or like plant nursery? I think maybe plant nursery, given okay. like, because he had, this guy had like a, a big estate. So I'd imagine like maybe it was like some sort of kind of concept gardening thing and landscaping giant landscapes stuff makes like. a lot more sense than becoming independently wealthy selling children selling children that happened at this time pretty pretty certain about That's that true you know too. 
Dickensian <laughs> era. Um, he received a liberal education, liberal for the time. I just want to point out liberal mean, meant a very different thing in the 18th and 19th century. Like, <laughs> very, very different. Not like, yeah. oh, liberal values and all of that. Like, liberal was basically like, you don't want to murder everyone you meet. Like, that's basically what a liberal was back then. Oh, you don't want to enslave people? You must be liberal. Um, <laughs> that's what that was. He received a liberal education and throughout life retained a taste for classical literature. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, by 1812, Miller has succeeded to his uh, father's estates at Craigentinny. Now, that's going to be very important to the story, the area of Craig and Tinney, which is very close to Edinburgh, so very close to the capital of Scotland, which was a, at this time a hotbed of like scientific inquiry, a bunch of amazing scientific discoveries made in Scotland around this time, but also um, it's kind of a bunch of cultural renaissances going on there. Edinburgh is becoming a hub of like artists as well and really cool places to eat and become successful in business and it's a great place to be edinburgh is still like that now if you ever get a chance to go to edinburgh i'd highly recommend it this is a weird thing you will have some of the best mexican food you have ever had in your life in edinburgh in, in scotland in scotland it's okay. crazy i <clears throat> know someone from texas went up there had this food and they were like yeah it, it blew my mind they're from austin okay so, well, now I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to take the trip to Scotland just to see if this, the Mexican food stands yep. up. Apparently it does. And that's because Edinburgh was also, it became a hub for immigration. You know, uh, outside of the slave trade, people moved to Edinburgh because it became this hub of okay. scientific inquiry, of culture. And, and people came from all over the world to the capital of Scotland and it became an incredible melting pot for all these different cultures coming together and hence why there's amazing food up there. So um, anyway, uh, he's ascended to his father's estate at Craig and Tinney, close to Edinburgh and Britwell Court in Buckinghamshire, also going to be super important in this conversation. He was elected a member of parliament for Newcastle under Lyne in 1830 and served as the MP until 1837. So Newcastle under Lyne, despite the fact this guy is Scottish, Newcastle under Lyne is actually only 30 miles north of me in England. So okay. it's like in the middle of England, this place, near, near, near Stoke. So uh, there's Newcastle upon Tyne, which is in the northeast, and then there's Newcastle under Lyne, which is in the Midlands. Very confusing for people who don't know uh, yeah. British geography, but yeah, I don't know. That. I don't know U.S. geography for the most part, so I'm lost right now. I, I did see I did see a video the other day of a guy on one of those like, you know, those like platforms when you can like click and someone random pops up and then you click again and someone else random pops up. I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, he was just people were popping up and they were all American. Who's going? What's the smallest country in the world? And he got a bunch of people saying Florida, Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> one one of them said Australia and he was like no nah, it's kind of big kind of big that one uh, another American person said Africa and he was like oh that's a continent um, and it's big um, Oof. and then one of them got really really close and they were like is it somewhere in Europe and he's like yes yes it is it, it, what is it and they were like Italy and he's like oh for fuck's sake you oh. know like if anyone listening it's the Vatican City it's an independent nation. Um, it's oh. the size of a mall. So that's how big the Vatican is. It is it the Mall of America? Basically smaller than that. Like, that's how <laughs> big it is. Um, and, and it has a, a inhabitant, something like 800 inhabitants, including uh, the Holy Father himself, the Pope. So um, also strange that Americans don't know the Netherlands. Yes, very true, Niels. And I, I had to apologize to my wife, even though she's not Dutch the other day because I called it Holland, and I was like, oh, that's so outdated of me. I'm sorry, it's the Netherlands. She's like, I don't care. I'm from Bristol. Calm down. Um, I didn't offend her, but yeah, it's the Netherlands. Holland is a region within the Netherlands. It's not the country itself. Anyway, I've gone off on a tangent again. I promised I wouldn't do this so much, but we'll get back to Henry Miller. <laughs> William Henry Miller. Um, so he's elected to Parliament as the MP for Newcastle under Lyne, in the Midlands of the UK. Miller seemed to be fairly progressive, 
at the time, not completely progressive. He supported free trade, which was actually kind of a new thing at the time. It was very heavily regulated and um, kind of, you know, we're in the Industrial Revolution now. So the idea of capitalism is very much a new thing. This kind of capitalism okay. is very, very new. Um, he supported reductions in public expenditure, which I think at the time was probably not a good thing. Like actually the public infrastructure needed a lot of spending, but they were spending it on like railways and stuff so that they could boost the economy through, um, you know, uh, industry trade. and stuff like that, trade, yeah. things like that. Um, and he was also pro abolition of slavery, which was still a thing. Uh, it wouldn't take long for it to be abolished, fortunately, but he was one of the driving forces behind the movement. Um, okay. So for the time, very liberal, really, because um, a bunch of people were very anti-abolitionist in this country in at this time. In the 1830s, oh yeah, bunch of people, including one guy who owned a vast swathe of North Wales. And you go to like where he lives, it's called Penring Castle. And he, sometimes when people build these estates to look like old castles, they're like, ah, oh, they just put a little castle. You know, make it look old. Make it look a thousand years old, even though it's only like a hundred years old. This guy decided to build the most fucking enormous fake castle you've ever seen in your life. You know, if you've ever watched Citizen Kane, they describe Xanadu as having like 300 rooms and fucking peacocks roaming the gardens. <laughs> That's this place. This guy who grew up on the, using the money from the slave trade in, in Jamaica and places like that. Trans once it, he was anti abolitionist because he wanted to keep on exploiting people and building another five wings on his house. Um, yep, and when that, that was abolished, sense, it does make absolute sense. And when it was abolished, he was like, I'm gonna buy a bunch of slate mines in North Wales and treat the Welsh people like absolute shit and almost slaves. Like, I will pay them nothing and they'll die in thousands, but you know, at least I'm paying them. So, um, step he up, was, I guess, yeah. And he was typical of the time. Like the people that could vote, the people that held power in this country, a lot of them didn't want to get rid of slavery. It was only when they were faced with the kind of the Christian idea of this is immoral that they were kind of like, oh God, we can't go against, otherwise we'll look like hypocrites and we'll become outcasts in this society. Okay, even though they clearly didn't care. So that's um, how it was won over. And this guy, William Henry Miller, driving force beh behind the abolition of slavery. So good for him on that. Okay. You know, good for him. Um, however, um, Miller seemed to be fairly progressive. We've talked about that. But he was regularly criticized for hesitating utterances, which um, is a very posh way of saying it was kind of quiet. Okay. Um, yeah, he he had a want of words as a public speaker and rarely spoke up with passion. Incredibly shy guy. He's very studious, but he can't do public speaking. So probably not helpful as a politician type person. Yeah, as a politician, particularly at this time when the power of your words were not conveyed by mass media and they were not amplified by microphones. You had to be a big, barrel-chested, shouting person to really be heard in this chamber that was crammed with like three, 400 uh, lawmakers. You had to make sure that you were heard, and to do that, you had to slam your fist down, you had to talk with passion, you mm. had to know what you were talking about, and he did know what he was talking about, a very passionate guy, but he wasn't a good public speaker, and I think that held him back because when people in your local constituency see news headlines, and there would have been papers at this time about you standing up for them or fighting for this, fight for that, it raises your profile and it means that they're more likely to vote for you again. Whereas if you're shy, if you don't really say much, they don't really know that you're there. So you might not get voted in next time. You know? Right. You're not doing anything for them. Exactly. You haven't you're got a doing platform. Anything. Yeah. You're just sort of reading and and stuff so that's what happened unfortunately he lost his parliamentary seat in 1841 after 11 years as an mp and essentially at this point he's a very shy guy kind of bookish and weird he decides to retire to his estate at craig and tinney and when when they say i'm going to retire to my estate these estates are enormous it's like three four thousand acres you know and 
they have to manage the farm. They have to manage the workers on the farm. They have to be my own parts of the local village and, and stuff like that. So they have to manage a bunch of properties. So it's not like they're sitting on a porch, you know, having a coffee. They're basically working the whole time. They're just not doing it in the public eye. So okay, he's retired to work and continue making a shitload of money while the, the peasants that work his land get by on barely anything. So that's what he did. Anyway, later in life, he became the spiritual successor to a guy called Richard Heber, um, basically as the most famous private book collector in all of Europe. Uh, yeah. Many of the rarest works from his collections of the latter passed into the library, which he formed at Britwell Court near Burham in Buckinghamshire. He was particularly... Um, he was particular in his choice of copies. Um, he collected thousands of books we're talking okay. like you think of like a major university um and a library in there he would have had like several floors of that library's worth of books like just an enormous collection of books that would be awesome it would wouldn't it <laughs> wouldn't it just just chill out there but he had a very specific kind of book that he wanted and what um, was that okay he had a habit of care of he would go everywhere looking for books he'd go to auctions he'd go to shops he'd go to special dealers he would walk everywhere with a foot long ruler made of wood just just a ruler like that okay. just, like, yeah um to measure the size of a tall copy of a book if the book was smaller than the ruler he wasn't going to buy it didn't matter if it was first edition signed really amazing thing if it wasn't a big fucking book he wasn't buying it. Huh. So he's like a, he's a size queen. He's a size queen. <laughs> he totally is a size queen. And as a result of this behavior, because he was like, it was what it was his passion was collecting enormous books. And it's a it's an interesting niche hobby. And I get it. Like he likes giant elaborate books. Good for you. But unfortunately, he became known as uh Measure Miller. That was his nickname. Oh. So, well, that's a cool to nickname, to... though. It's a kind of a cool nickname. I think 12 Inch Billy would have been <laughs> a more interesting nickname. <laughs> that that but, would have worked. Yeah. Oh, hey, it's it's 12 Inch Billy over here. 12 Inch William. Um, that's way better than my big ass book guy. <laughs> big ass book fucker. <laughs> Look, it's the quiet guy who really likes books. So um, he's just walking around everywhere with a giant ruler. Uh, and like he doesn't care at this point he's retired he's got a massive collection of books it's his passion he's living on his estate collecting these things uh, generally didn't care about what was in the books just as long as they looked amazing on his shelves he was like oh that's my thing and i kind of get that like as a man and i don't want to pigeonhole just men i'm sure women do this as well but there's something about i have like downstairs i have a bunch i have about a thousand wrestling magazines <laughs> from okay. like the last 20 years i've collected them all they're worth quite a bit of money now but okay. yeah 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 so like i've kind of unintentionally built up this collection without realizing it and actually i look at it now and some of them i've written for so there's like about 20 or so editions that i've written in you know as, as an actual writer and i look at it and i go i never even realized i built up this collection but i have and it takes up like half a shelf on my bookcase of like magazines like, that's how many i've got so that's that's stacked there uh, there's only like 35 pages in each one as well so it's like a huge amount it must be like 250 editions but um yeah it's a lot but i get that like i think when you're of a certain age as a man and like you've got a thing a passion that you like and it's it's not doing anyone anyone any harm why not do it my wife has like 20 pairs of dungarees most of which I bought are like, that's her thing. That's what she collects, okay. dungarees. And she looks great in them. She loves them. She's super comfortable in them. She's got 20 of them. And I'm like, we need another wardrobe now. Fuck. <laughs> uh, so I get it. People collect things. This guy's thing was giant books and he walked around with a ruler everywhere. Good for him. You know, yeah. it was golf clubs. No, one would bat an eyelid. No, uh, no. no. He would be uh, just the same. He'd just be some old guy playing golf. Exactly. Just some guy going around doing what he loved. Good for him. Um, the Britwell Library, formerly uh, formed chiefly at the time 
of the dispersal of um, his predecessor, the, uh, let's see, what was his name? Richard Haber, his collection, and other important collections, and then added to by acquisitions from a bunch of people, including Thomas Corsa, Lang, and other sales. It was unrivaled amongst private libraries for the number, rarity, and condition of its examples of early English and Scottish literature. It had everything in here, most of them huge. So, okay. Yeah, incredible. And everything in his big ass book collection. Just an enormous collection of big ass books. It contains six works from William Caxton's press. I don't know what that is. Uh, many printed by Wiccan de Word, who is like a medieval writer. So okay. before the printing press, um, which is kind of amazing. So all handwritten books. Damn. Yeah, man. Uh, and Richard Pinson. Um, and the greater part of the Heber collection of ballads and broadsides, so a bunch of like poetry and cool shit All like right. that. So that's what that guy did. It was especially rich in early English poetry, so like some of the earliest books written in English, because a lot of them were still written in Latin at this time, um, right yeah. up until like a very early, late point in history. So I, I forgot that we're we're at we're 1840s right now. 1840s, yeah. So stuff was still getting printed in Latin and and stuff. So it was only really. Printing stuff in English really only came around because of Chaucer, like a few hundred years earlier. So, you know, if you can get books written in early English around that time, it's basically a different language. So, kind of cool to be able to see that. Um, he possesses the finest and most complete series in existence of Theodore de Bry's collection of voyages to the East and West Indies. This guy had basically the entire uh, East and West Indies and the Caribbean mapped out in this room some of the most intensely accurate maps of the time were just in this one collection nice yeah and people would travel from all over the world to study the materials in this place it became like the the library of alexandria housing all these lost classics I feel like this guy might have been on the spectrum i feel like so and you're about to think yes when i tell you the rest of it because it gets like this isn't weird to me this is just like he has a he has a lot of money and yeah. he likes books so he's just gone all in and i'm like good he's doing what he loves that's great it gets really weird though later um the library had a crest showing a right hand holding an open book so he had an actual crest for the fucking library yeah. um the, the collection of rare books was housed in a library built in 1864 which with the provision of steel doors and mains water hydrants was intended to be fireproofed he fireproofed a room in the 19th century there you go god damn he loved, he loved his, his books. books he fucking <laughs> loved books man <laughs> shit um the house and the library collection stayed with the family until 1919, in which the house and the collection was sold and the collection split up. A lot of it ended up in public hands, which is great. So all of this collected works is now available to the public in public libraries. You know, you can't take it out, but you can go to these libraries and you can see the resources online and you can read this book in the library, these hundreds of year old English books. It's really cool that you can do that. Yeah, I'm glad that they split that up. Um, that happens a lot around these old estates. They were sold off to the National Trust, and you can now go visit them. Uh, I'm a member of the National Trust. You pay like 70, uh, 75 bucks a year, and you can go to any National Trust site for free. You can park up. There's always like a cafe there. You can spend all day in these massive estates. And, you know, it's, it's a good day out, you know? They're usually That's open all year round. Get out of the rain. It's great. That is that's an interesting thing. You get to go yeah. check out like, history and books. Absolutely. And I get to sit on an ancient toilet. Like that yeah. is cool to me. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm shitting where thousands of people have shit before throughout history. <laughs> Very cool. That is a uh, thing, I guess. <laughs> that was a thing uh, for me as a historian and Crohn's disease sufferer. That's a really cool thing. Um, so um, unfortunately he kind of faded into the background a little bit. And Miller died unmarried at the age of just 60, which for his standing um, uh, was was quite young, even at this time, like he should have lived longer than that. Most of them would have lived until their 80s, but he was quite pale and drawn and thin. So there was probably some sort of underlying condition that hadn't been diagnosed. So hiding inside with the books and not going out in the sun. 
Yeah, he ain't getting that vitamin D, exactly. Just work the land a little bit for just a couple of days a month. Just go out into the fields and talk to your folks. Um, and so after a short illness, he died on the 31st of October, 1848, in Craigentinny. Now this is where it starts to get weird. Um, so he's so dead. he died on Halloween? That's the first sign that this is... <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the next sign is his will. Um, he allocated a significant sum from his substantial fortune. He wasn't one of these people. We've covered um, a, a, a Welsh, um, famous Welsh kind of dandy who was a landed gentry who blew his money. £15 million he blew in five years. And we covered him. He lost a bunch of jewellery. He got Arthur Conan Doyle to find it for him. And he was like, uh, maybe it was the guy you left with it that stole it all and who has now fucked off to France. Like, oh, yeah, we'll go and check in the borders. And sure enough, they found him. So he wasn't like this. This guy was successful. And if anything, he grew his fortune. So okay. he, he his estate flourished. He made a lot of money and he bequeathed it to various members of his family. But also he set aside a huge war chest, kind of a bit like what Steve Jobs did where he was like, here you go, Apple, here's 70 billion, go and put Google out of business. Um, he didn't do that. He did something weirder. Um, in his will, he allocated significant funds for his substantial fortune for an elaborate burial and specified the details in his internment. It was a massive document with loads of detail. I want exactly this, and you are to do this and nothing else. So okay. let me describe the insanity that is the Craig and Tinney marbles to you now. 80 laborers 80 okay. were hired to begin just the initial phase of his tomb. So they he wanted a tomb and he wanted to be buried 80 feet below ground. That's more than six. That's more than six by a fair <laughs> wide margin. <laughs> uh, so 80 laborers initially just excavating a 30 foot deep stone lined pit as his grave. So they've gone 30 feet down. Okay. From there, a large stone slab was positioned over his lead-encased coffin. Was he worried he was going to turn into a vampire or something? <laughs> That's exactly what people thought. Okay. <laughs> so the coffin is made of thick lead, and it right. wasn't just there wasn't just um, a giant stone tab uh, lined pit uh, on. There wasn't a, just a slab on top of it. There were slabs on every single side beneath it, either side of it, either end of it, on top of it. He was entombed in this thing. Just in case. Uh, just in case, you know, he decides to go for a walk. Um, the location was on the Craig and Tinney estate, which was very remote at the time. It was through a bunch of woods. Not so much now. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, work started on the monument to mark his grave. So they've they've built the grave. 80 people dug the thing. He's in his lead tomb. They've put a giant fucking rock on top of it and around it as well. Um, and Miller had specified that it should be based on the temple of Vesta at Tivoli. He wanted a giant temple built around his stone encased lead lined coffin. A temple uh, to, made of marble to him, uh, or just in, in general. Just in general. Well, actually, we'll get to what was okay. ended up happening. But he wanted a temple, basically the size of a fucking enormous, basically the size of his estate, for just him. Okay. Um, work then started on the monument. Uh, so on the monument. They uh, came in, they brought in an architect called David Rind, uh, who was familiar with the actual temple itself that it was going to be based on. Um, thankfully, obviously, William Henry Miller is already dead, and he was like, just do this for me. The architect took one look at the plans and realized that they were too ambitious, which I think is a polite way of saying fucking crazy. <laughs> and the project was altered to a mausoleum based on the tombs of Rome's Apian Way, which have been around for thousands of years. So, yeah. Okay. Giant mausoleum. It features on the mausoleum two bas relief sculptures by a sculptor called Alfred Gatley, depicting part of the biblical narrative of Exodus. 
Um, the north part of the tomb, there is the overthrow of the pharaoh in the in the Red Sea, which shows the destruction of Ramesses II's army during the crossing of the Red Sea when the waves come back down and swallow up, and Disney music plays, and you know. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking of the Prince of Egypt. Um, the relief on the south face was the Song of Moses and Miriam, which depicts the Israelites singing a song of celebration for their escape and the destruction of the Egyptian army. So it's basically just Moses going <laughs> like that from the, from the shoreline. Um, the Pharaoh bass relief, which is what the things are called, was finished in time to be displayed at the, the 1862 International Exhibition in London. But the song bass relief was completed just before Gatley's death from dysentery in 1863, making this killed him. Oh, he shit himself to death. I know that feeling. Oh, um, yeah. It, it's no way to go. Um, the Should panels. It's it's not a way to die. You don't want to die that way. Um, the panels were described as the most remarkable pieces of sculpture executed during this century. Okay. Yeah, and attracted artists from all over the world to see them before they were placed on the tomb and after they were placed on the tomb. So. The last element of the now scaled back mausoleum that they decided to put in place of a giant fucking enormous temple wasn't completed until 15 years after this guy died. Cool. That's how specific he was. Um, now, he I've done a little bit of... Like a, he wanted to be a pharaoh himself. He wanted his own pyramid to last and people be like, oh my, this guy must have been important. He was so powerful. Oh my God, did he take people with him? Um, now, I want to show you Craig and Tinney. Um, okay. It's been developed since. It's yeah. nowhere, because Edinburgh at the time, fast, like forest, open grassland and stuff. Now it's capital city of Scotland. Obviously, you've got to have estates and stuff. So... Um, let me show you uh, Craig and Tinny Crescent, I think it's called. So I'm just going to um, add this to the stage. Uh, I apologize in advance to the people who are listening on a podcast. So let me just um, open this. So I'm going to browse through. Uh, so you can see now basic traditional British estate, um, skinny road. You've got cars here. You've got like bungalows, so like single story houses. Some people have extended and built like little uh balconies on on the top of their bungalows there that's really cool they've got a uh, extension normal cars normal street it's 20 miles an hour that's that's great good and you spin back around you're like, okay grass nice kept gardens standard stuff and then you turn around oh there's there's a thing what's this thing here oh it's a bowling club okay that's cool so they got like a bowling green there someone oh someone's cleaning it right now or cutting the grass lovely it's like a and then you go what the fuck is that oh <laughs> i just want to point out this is a normal sized human being here that is uh, huge th then there's this thing wow it, that's it huh that's the thing it dwarfs and he is 30 feet below it uh -huh. this is 50 foot tall Man, and then there's the wall around it here. And there's the wall around it, and then there's the raised platform. And he is like down here somewhere, probably under the car park. Yeah. Like <laughs> Richard the Third. Just like a normal housing estate, you know, straightforward houses, lovely cars, and then boom, giant, ridiculous mausoleum on uh I think it what's the road called? Craig and Tinney Crescent. So if you Do go you... onto Google Earth, you can see this enormous fucking mausoleum and these like greatest sculptures of the 18th century carved into the side of them. Um, Do they you are... think the people that bought those houses know that there's a dude under there <laughs> in a <laughs> lead coffin? In a lead coffin. Can you imagine? Like, imagine if the estate agent only takes him around at night. And they like <laughs> they can't see it, and then they buy it, and then they haven't had a chance to see it in the day, and they're like, "What the fuck?" Um, <laughs> this is an enormous mausoleum. Also, this one, someone's built a balcony here. They've got chairs on their balcony to sit out and take in the evening. And I'm like, "Oh, that's really cool. It's a couple. It's nice and romantic." And then, boom, they're staring at a giant mausoleum. Maybe they just think. Maybe they think it's a statue. 
and that they really like the the carving and they just think it's a beautiful sculpture they have no idea that it's a dead person's like <laughs> tombstone thing crazy last wish you know what i think it might be i think this house belongs to a secret society of watchers and every night there's two of them that have to stare over watch over this thing to make sure that nothing comes out of there otherwise it might be the end of the world um that's my theory <laughs> Dude, we've got to start that. This is the conspiracy theory that nobody knows yet. That's the conspiracy this guy theory. That nobody's heard of that has this weird thing for no reason. <laughs> there's a reason that he's in a lead coffin and there's two people in this house over here that look over it. Watch the, it. the watchers. Um well, and there's they have a lovely Ford escort. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so like it's it's such a weird thing. I mean, you do occasionally we, in the UK. We have quite a few like war memorials, World War Two, World War One, and a lot of these places, these towns and villages, will have like a little cenotaph. So it'll be like the Washington Monument, only on a much smaller scale. It'll be like twelve foot tall or something like that. Nobody has a fucking fifty foot tall, massive neoclassic mausoleum across the road from their front garden. It's like living in a flat that overlooks like the the Taj Mahal or something like that's how crazy this is it's kind of um, weird yeah it is weird and um so I, I'm really glad I could share that with you um I was like I wanted to put it into perspective it's such an unusual thing but um once it was completed um the mausoleum cost 20,000 pounds at the time or um the equivalent of two million pounds in 2024 money. Okay. I mean, Shit load of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money, but I mean, mm. like, I think Elon would probably spend more than that on his. Okay. Yeah. Like, uh, what do you think Elon's mausoleum is going to look like? And do you think that he's going to be in a lead coffin? I think it's going to be, I think he's going to be fired into space. Oh, yeah. It's going to be on Mars is where his mausoleum will be. And it's going to be a hundred feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> he will, you know, do you remember Star Trek with the fucking Genesis probe where they like send it out and it births life. He's like, use my ashes as the Genesis probe. Just fucking fire me into Mars so that we can colonize it. Uh, and it'll spread life. No, I, I genuinely think so. And actually, you know, we talk about 2 million uh, for this mausoleum. It was a lot of money. Nicholas Cage had a fucking quite large but nowhere near as big as that like pyramid in new orleans that he bought like a funeral plot that was like 1.7 million dollars or something like that and he had to give that up because of course he owed all that money to the tax man but oh. yeah um i don't think two million is a lot and i i like you say i think a lot of the billionaires that are alive today now will probably have elaborate ways of you know I burying themselves so. Bezos is definitely like he's already building like a crazy ass bunker, so I'd imagine he's going to be buried in that or something. So he doesn't think he's dying, he's <sighs> going to be turned into a computer, he's going to clone himself and his maid, so he'll be absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> living next to a cemetery of one is crazy, yeah. You know, the weird thing is that um, a lot of chapels are very old chapels, like hundreds of years old, get converted every week in the UK into homes. I would live next to a cemetery. I have no problem with that at all. It just means that nobody else is fucking moving in next door to you. Like That's true. Yeah. That is true. Unless some unscrupulous developer buys it up and then puts in a track home and then poltergeist come and little Mary Ann exactly. gets, or Carrie Ann gets pulled into the closet by the clown doll. Yeah. Wait. In that case, then I might sell up. Um, yeah. if that's going to happen, because I saw that fucking film and it scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> I was that age as well. That was a nightmare for a long time. But anyway, yeah, so... Yeah, childhood trauma, that and it. Um, <laughs> so, Tim Curry. Hello, Georgie! He's like, oh, fucking hell no. Um, so, let's get on to the question that everyone is wondering. Why did William go to all of this trouble? Yes. Um, is he hiding something... Or is he just like a crazy rich person? Yeah. So <laughs> what's the answer? Well, as you can imagine, even though he tries to keep this quiet, you kind of can't keep a 50 foot tall mausoleum quiet, even in like farthest flung Scotland. You know, people start talking when they're like 
Is he compensating over here? Yeah. He's, he's good to Tony Willie. Uh, so um, it wasn't long after Miller was laid to rest that people began to speculate why he had wanted to be buried um, 80 feet underground as opposed to the conventional six. Um, in his lifetime, William Miller was a very secretive man of slender structure, as they have a slender structure, okay. um, and some believed his instructions were proof he had something to hide. And what did they think he was hiding? In 1890, the book Old and New Edinburgh said of Miller, he was averred to be a changeling. Yeah, it's a bit gross. Okay. Yeah. Even a woman, a suggestion which his thin figure, weak voice, absence of all beard, that's that's highlighted, all beard, and okay. some peculiarity of habit seem to corroborate. He was skinny, weak, and weird. Therefore, he's a woman. It's like, oh, what a wonderful <laughs> book to read. <laughs> okay, that's a stretch, yeah. but I mean, I, so they're saying that he, uh, well, what was that? Like, Do you want me to read the description again? He well, was averred just... to be a changeling. Okay, so they think that he's just he would just switch with the, some for the, some creature from the woods. <laughs> I th I, they use the word changeling, um, which I think has actually been used uh, for the film Eddie Redmayne won an Oscar for or was n nominated for an Oscar for. Um, it means intersex, I think, is what they're going for. Oh, so, see, I was thinking the, the mythology thing. Well, scary movies. <laughs> Keep that at the back of your mind, because okay. that comes back into play. Um, but yeah, basically, the initial thought was maybe he's either intersex or he's actually a woman and he posed as a man all of his life. And the reason he's gone to all of this trouble um, is because he doesn't want anyone finding out. The rumors are also partially because of the six week period between his death and the eventual internment. But actually, when you look at like his will and the crazy depths that he went to, like you have to dig me thirty feet deep, and it has to be in lead lined coffin, and there have to be stones all around me, like six weeks doesn't sound that bad for all of that shit. Yeah, like, if you've ever dealt with a contractor, like if you said <laughs> yeah. to them, "Dig me a thirty foot hole, and I want a bunch of lead in it and a bunch of stone," they'd have been like eighteen months, you know? Right? Yeah, <laughs> so they just stretch that all out. Um, but um, if he had indeed been a woman, how better to make sure nobody could get a good look at his womanly parts than being buried in a lead lined box beneath a huge slab, you know, 30 feet underground. There have been even weirder conspiracy theories, and you've already mentioned both of them. Um, some people genuinely believed he was either a vampire or a different supernatural being like a fairy. Okay. So, you mentioned both. Is he a vampire? People genuinely thought that. And it led to like... I don't know if you can say like people trying to dig him up because there's no way they're digging him up. Like the 18 whatever it was. But they would like hang around to like see if he would come out of the grave and feast <laughs> on the blood of the innocent. <laughs> so well, I mean, it matters about as much as if he... Were any of the other things exactly? But like, <laughs> come on, I know. And also, I have to, I have to point out, this is uh, Victorian era UK. There was a big fascination with death of the occult around this time. So, slightly odd-looking dude buries himself in a massive mausoleum. People are going to be like, "No, vampire, fucking yeah. vampire over there." When, um, yeah. When was Nosferatu? When did that come out? Uh, well, Anne Rice's Dracula, Dracula novel, just Googling in the middle of a podcast. Yeah, um, 1897. So we're, we're not too far away, like 30 years away, but it's in the kind of the cultural thinking, you know, mm -hmm. that, that thing. Because, you know, people knew about Vlad the Impaler and like fucking people in Romania sticking stakes into people to make sure they were dead and shit. So. Yeah. You know. Well, see, that totally makes sense. I I go with yeah. that before they think that he's got like, but I mean, that makes sense too, though I suppose. But like, yeah, it's it's the thing is, and and I we've said this before. It's like every good conspiracy theory in that there is they just the slightest sprinkling 
of like a morsel of potential truth in there. I'm just going to do something weird when I die now just to make people go, why did he do that? I did it just to make you do that. But you also have to be super serious about it. Like you have to have a meeting where you bring in five people that, you know, are massive fucking gossips. But you also say to them, listen, this is really important. You are my most trusted advisors. You have to burn me at sunrise and then bury me with silver. Facing east. Facing east. (laughs) Why? Listen, just do it. I can't tell you anymore. And then bury me 190 meters down. (laughs) And there need to be people with guns pointed at the entrance to that at all times. Not going to say any (laughs) more. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, these fucking idiots go out and like, oh my God, he was secretly a woman. Um, or something like that. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> and that's the natural conclusion. Strange decisions, naturally a woman. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, the vampire thing and the fairies thing, obviously, like Victorian era England and Scotland, just, you know, people, and also Scotland burned a lot of witches. Holy shit, did they burn a lot of witches? Um, so yeah, um, the most likely reason for the elaborate form of internment, and particularly as he was quite a shut in and he was actually naturally quite afraid of really quite horrible things happening to him, um, can be found in Edinburgh and Scotland's history at the time. So in the 18th century, we've mentioned already, was a revolutionary time across the UK and Scotland was no different. Edinburgh was a leading European centre of anatomical study in the 19th century. Uh, you already know where I'm going with this, don't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> in a time when the demand for cadavers led to a shortfall in legal supply, um, Scottish law required that corpses used for medical research should only come from those who had died in prison, suicide victims, or from foundlings and orphans. So, basically, if you were considered poor or an outcast, people could cut your body open however they wanted. But if you were rich, no, 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 no. You've got to leave that fancy corpse alone. Yeah. In but all they do that. Yeah. Like, oh, a prisoner? Yeah, just fucking throw it on the table. Cut it to pieces. Yeah, it's fine. Insane? On the table. Yeah. <laughs> Orphan? Oh, delicious. On the table with the orphans. Rich wait hang on this person had savings no fuck get that out of here we're not monsters <laughs> <laughs> we leave the rich alone um so the shortage of corpses led to an increase in body snatching by and this is a cool name for a film i know there's been already a bunch of films made about this um snatching by uh what were known as resurrection men yeah awesome fucking name and kimberly you read my mind he didn't want to get burkened head I'm going to go straight to Birkenhair right now. I was actually thinking of covering them for Halloween, but I, I'm going to kind of jump the gun a little bit. Uh, measures to ensure that graves were left left undisturbed, such as mort safes, which are giant metal cages over the top of the graves, like okay. fucking enormous bars that were planted deep into the ground. So not only would you have to have excavated the grave and gone under the the tomb and all of that you would have had to get through the fucking bars first and people didn't have like oxyacetylene while they were out and about in you know 19th century scotland um so this led this shortage led to people like burke and hare murdering fellow lodgers and selling their corpses to medical professionals for the equivalent of 650 pounds each in today's money so but 650 pounds it doesn't sound like a lot. Like I'll be like, oh god, six hundred and fifty. Like what? Hunger and really fucking struggle this month. Back then, that's like six months' wages. You know, so okay. pretty good money. Um, in total, Burke and Hare murdered sixteen people in ten months. <laughs> Most of them were their logic. Were like neighbors of theirs. Like, well, this one's got a bit of a cough. Let's speed up the process a little bit. Um, <laughs> And also their wives were fully aware of this. And they're like, listen, I want some more gingham. And I want to have some cough drops. And I want the finest rabbit, the the local 
restaurant can offer. Go out and kill a lodger so that we can eat and live well. You know? E e Goodness. Horrible. Yeah, so they murdered... I'd like to say we've evolved so far since then. Um, I mean, we probably keep it to a, an even dozen. You know? <laughs> well, I'm not Sticks. offing anybody for a rabbit. No. Anybody no. at all. No, and it'd have to have at least another zero for me to off someone. You know, 650 quid, that, come on. I, I'm going to incur more expenses than that. Do you know how much petrol is these days? I'm going to have to travel to murder this person. Uh, so <laughs> I'm getting off track. But um, in the 10 months that they were doing this, Burke and Hare earned around £11,520 in today's money, which back then was more than enough money for them and their wives who were completely complicit to retire on. They could have retired on that and never had to work another day in their lives. But they were caught. <laughs> and yeah, Burke was hanged in public in front of 25,000 people who were Ooh. like, yeah, came for the show. That's a, uh, Did they sell tickets? That's a hell of a show, man. They, they didn't. They... <laughs> That's why they had to outlaw it in this country. They had to do, uh, they outlawed public hangings because it was too popular and it was becoming a safety risk. People were dying at hangings. Oh my goodness. Than the people that were supposed to be hanged. That's what is wrong with us. <laughs> and this is a weird thing. I was looking at um, one of the things when Christopher Lee passed away. One of the things that they're like, all of these achievements, like, oh, he's been in over 250 films. He's been Vamp. He's been Dracula. He's been in Star Wars. He was in Lord of the Rings. He was and all this. And then they get until he was a spy in the war. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. He was a spy in the war. He killed a bunch of Nazis. Oh, yeah, he did kill a bunch of Nazis. Um, he, when he was young, he was one of the last people alive to witness a, 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 a guillotine execution in person in public. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> he saw someone get guillotined in person in public. That's messed up. That's how old Christopher Lee was. Holy shit! He only uh, died like ten years ago. How? Old? When was, was like when was the last? Wait, I think wait. it was like nineteen fifteen, nineteen twenty, something like that. That's so messed up. That's pretty fucked up, man. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> um, despite Burke being hanged in public in front of 25,000 people face crimes. The trade in corpses was incredibly lucrative for years afterwards because the advancement in science and stuff. And, and actually, uh, uh, away from the judgment of this, Leonardo da Vinci dug up corpses and studied them for his own anatomy. That's why Michelangelo's... Not Leonardo da Vinci, sorry, Michelangelo and artists of the time, they all studied dead bodies. And that's why Michelangelo's David is as perfect an anatomical specimen as it is is because this man had studied every inch of living and dead men's bodies so yeah he he knew what muscles did he knew where the the veins would go on the muscles he knew like what hairs would leave marks and stuff that's why michelangelo's david is like a living thing it's frightening so yeah um yeah. but um, freshly preserved corpses were guaranteed an easy payday back in the day and William Henry Miller knew this so he decided to bury himself in basically the 18th century's answer to a fallout vault um, and, and yeah and he did it yeah he did he, <laughs> he, yeah, he fucking did. He was buried with a bunch of expensive keepsakes as well, and some of his books. So I'd imagine those are probably worth a fair bit of money. And it wouldn't I wouldn't put it beyond someone to to dig up his grave and steal that. And he was like, you know what? I'm gonna have the last laugh. I'm gonna have the most elaborate fucking mausoleum temple thing you have ever seen, and no one's gonna get anywhere near me. And they haven't. So So he won. That's yeah, that's the story of William Henry Miller, politician giant book collector possible intersex vampire if you believe the rumors but really <laughs> he was basically and we have this a lot these days he was kind of a generally normal person who happened to have a lot of money to indulge in the stuff that he liked and yeah. that's it you know if, if you an interesting yeah. person that indulged really in interesting. interesting things yeah and that's why I wanted to talk about it, because after his death, he became way more famous than he was during his lifetime. 
because people were like, there's a fucking vampire in there. Do you want to live across the road from the vampire? We've got a balcony and everything. Uh, that'll be £500,000, please. It's a bungalow with two bedrooms. 500000 You're living next door to a vampire. Give me the cool money. You know? Yes. Do, oh, so, dude. Airbnb that thing? Oh, my God. You could make a killing. <clears throat> Give me that uh-huh. address. Nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I can't... Kristen Tenney Crescent or whatever it was. He was, uh, he was the Count of St. Germain He's actually not in there. Yes, he's he he he's built. Why is there a, a an exit sign on the back of this mausoleum? Why is there a big red light? Um, oh, that is part of the the carving and stuff. Yeah, but there's a door here as well, uh, and it looks like he's been coming and going. No, nah, don't worry about it. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, that's William Henry Miller, um, massive, interesting book collector and owner of. One of the most ridiculous mausoleums you'll ever see in your life, really. Yeah. So, um, what I do don't you even think know how to rate him? that. I know. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that he was an idiot. I would say he was just kind of an interesting guy. I think the idiocy really comes from people who just speculated about his life, really, in an unnecessary way. It reminds me a little bit, and I'm not saying a direct comparison, but it reminds me a little bit of the Michael Jackson thing, in that he lent into the peculiarity of his day-to-day life while he was alive. And then after he died, it perpetuated as a result of that. Yeah. So, you know, um, Michael Jackson, also frail, skinny, high-pitched voice, can't grow a beard. Um, you know, it, it, very similar to this guy. So, you know, people just targeted him and he was like, I'll roll with it. And then after he died, they're like, oh yeah, he was a vampire. So... <laughs> Did anybody say Mike, Michael was a vampire? Um, no, I think they thought he was an alien. Was one okay. of the popular theories. Yeah, I think he, a lot of those stories he planted himself, though. That's yeah. the thing. You, know, you don't know what's like. Oh no, the press is so intrusive. It's like, yeah, but you gave them that story two months ago, Michael. Remember? Oh yeah, I did. That was funny. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Michael Jackson fucking around. But yeah, um, so I'm not expecting any particular score with this guy because not really an idiot. Just interesting yeah i give the townsfolk 25 for thinking he was a vampire fairy intersex person yes there you go bunch of amazing stories and i guarantee a bunch of them believed it as well well for a short story that was an hour so holy uh, shit i'm sorry (laughs) man i just like listening to your stories i'm just gonna do that i'm just gonna hang out and listen to your stories from now on (laughs) i I don't even i I have a bunch of them i promise not all of them at all um, all you got tall tales. I got tall tales. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't walk around with a ruler, but I do have tall tales in tall books that will probably be collected by someone. So, what? So, you're going to go with a 25 for the townspeople? Yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that's a, a good one. Yeah. Um, he, he gets. I think he can have a 15 because his sure. stupid idea to get buried with stupid <laughs> idea things and. Um, yeah. Other than that, I just think he was an odd feller. I I would say so. I I um I'm really glad that his private collection of interesting books is now in the hands of the public, and that a bunch of people have access to these kind of one-off amazing pieces of like old English folklore and fiction and stuff. But um, yeah, he um, and also he was an abolitionist. So good, you know that that's great points with that but walking around with the ruler wanting to be buried in a giant fucking temple uh yeah it's kind of weird yeah (laughs) no two ways about it for sure i don't even like yeah i don't know how to transition i'm never i never go second this is confusing (laughs) to me that's okay so i i will help i'll seg i'll get my segue out and we will segue together um segue (laughs) i do want to segue kind of but i also like I think I'm at the point where I'm like, oh, segue, yeah, that that's something that would work for me. But actually, maybe I just want to sit down. So maybe I just want one of those <laughs> buggies that old people have. <laughs> I destroy I whatever want. credibility I would have with the segue. You know? Yeah. Well, anyway. Also, also I want to be warm. <laughs> so maybe I just get in the car. Um, so, <laughs> so Derek, who is your idiot 
for us this um, week? Well, I was thinking because I'm watching baseball all the time. Yes. Uh, it's baseball season in full swing here in the States. Mm-hmm. Uh, the past few years, there's been a lot of rule changes trying to speed up the game. Yeah, I've seen that. Trying to make it more exciting. Yeah. And there's one thing that really doesn't make it more exciting, and that's when the people that are making the calls absolutely suck at their jobs and get to keep them, which seems to be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for one dude in particular who is kind of in the news right now for a game just a couple of days ago that was super, super horrible. But I'll talk about that more in a minute. Sure. Uh, I want to tell everybody today about the most controversial, controversial and possibly the worst umpire in Major League Baseball history. Mm -hmm. Angel Hernandez. Angel Hernandez. Um, And and. We do have thank th- uh, technology to thank for this that we can now go back and see how horribly uh, wrong his calls are, <laughs> because he was running around saying, "I get maybe four calls a game wrong." Actually, it's it's not. It's much more than that, isn't it? Much, much more. <laughs> we'll get to that though. He's sure. he's born on the twenty sixth of August, nineteen sixty one, in Havana, Cuba. Which you know, he just had some Cuban food, so that fits too. <laughs> He didn't stay there long. He grew up in Hialeah, Florida, and oh. began umpiring straight out of high school. He went to work wow. at the Florida State League, bounced around a bit from state to state, North Carolina. Uh, he did a little filling in in the National League in the early 90s as, cool. a, as a substitute. In yes. 93, he took the big step, became a full-time major league umpire in the National League. And mm-hmm. in 1998, his, the first of his incidents occurred. I call them incidents because, like... There's a lot of them. Yeah, well, he's got bad calls. Okay. And you can't... I can't go over every one of his bad calls because he's got so many bad controversial calls that will be here for, like, the next three and a half weeks if sure. I went through all of them. So we'll go through his <laughs> incidents, sure. which are just bad calls that had funny shit that happened with them okay i love this stuff in baseball so in 1998 he's behind the plate for a game between the new york mets and the uh <laughs> so we're Brand. laughing at this comment from kimberly that dude is voldemort to my uncles that's a fucking great comment oh my god yeah you don't want to speak of this guy because it just no. brings bad luck to your games he does Sorry, please and continue. Bad calls. Anyway, so in this game, he's he's behind the plate for the New York Mets and the Atlanta Braves. It's the day before the All-Star break. Mm. It's in extra innings. It's the 11th inning. The Braves wow. got a, a runner, Michael Tucker, on base. A fly ball is hit to left. Michael tags up, and then Hernandez rules him safe at the plate, even though on replay... They show that uh, Mike Piazza makes the tag and the runner, Tucker, never even touches home plate at all. <laughs> it's just standing there, like accepting his fate. Slides past, gets tagged, doesn't ever touch home plate. Of course, he's <sighs> safe and um, Angel Hernandez doesn't overturn it, even with the video evidence. Oh uh, he goes on to continue to make blatant suspect calls. And in by 1999, he's ranked 31st out of 36 professional umpires in the Major League Baseball by the the Players Association. And, and also, just just he's kind of still quite young at this point oh yeah, because a lot of these umpires are old men, right? So he's yeah really he's underperforming. 20? Yeah, he's well, like he's twenty 61, something, 90. thirty maybe. Yeah, yeah, thirty two. Okay, so he's very young for an umpire. Yeah, and he's already making a name for himself as one of the worst umpires in baseball by 99, according to the players that he is officiating. And he's still still working today. That's amazing. Oh, my God. Um, Despite those poor reviews, he's retained for the 2000 season, even though there was like a purge of sorts in the 2000 season where they, they... collectivized the um, umpires for the the different uh, leagues after they did the reorganization after the the strikes. 
Right. Uh, he survived over 13 of his peers that scored higher than him somehow. Wow. How? I don't know. I, I think he has something on somebody, but I wasn't able to find anything on that. He just keeps surviving, even wow. though he sued the league, which we'll talk about, too. Okay. Uh, despite being one of the lowest ranked umpires, he manages to get assigned to high profile games like the 2002 and the 2005 World Series. He also gets assigned to seven league championship series and 12 division game series. Wow. And in uh, 2001, he's the home plate umpire for a game against the Chicago or between the Chicago Cubs and the Rockies, okay. where in the sixth inning, he makes a suspect call at the plate that leads to they, they've got a visiting celebrity there to sing the seventh inning stretch take me out to the ball game sure yeah that visitor gets on the pa he's a, a chicago bears defensive tackle big old dude okay. uh stephen mcmichael oh mongo yeah mongo mcmichael ah. yes he yeah. was in wrestling i'm sorry he gets, it he gets on again. Gets on the PA and he says, he says, me and Ains are going to have to have some words because of this thing, which ends up getting him kicked out before he could sing the song. Everybody's mad at Angel Hernandez thinking that he gets he's the one that gets him kicked out. But it was the crew chief thinking about safety. But that's just oh, one more controversial incident that happened. Because also they, of, they, yeah, they did. They did the crowd a favor. No one wants to hear Steve McMichael sing. Sorry. Fair. He can't sing, for sure. He's better. He's a better singer than Angel Hernandez is an umpire. Good point. Very good point. Again, this is another one where they presented him video evidence that he was wrong, and he said, no, it wasn't. Wow. So Dude, is he just like, do you think he knows? Or is he just like, oh, no, no, I'm definitely not wrong. Do you think he's delusional? I don't know if it's because... Um, as an umpire, you kind of have to stick to your guns, and even if you're wrong, you have to be right because that's the way the game is played. Maybe he's got that. I think it's just that he is just so arrogant that he can't be wrong. Wow. But that's just my own personal alleged opinion. I, I don't want to sure. get sued because I we get, We're going to say alleged a lot in this episode. <laughs> um, in 2006, another poll came out by Sports Illustrated. He's listed as the worst baseball umpire by the Players Association again. God. Uh, in one survey, 22% of Major League ball players were asked uh, who the worst umpire is, or 22% of ball players asked said it was Angel Hernandez. Oh, God. Um, in 2006, another notable thing happens on July 17th. He's the third place, third base umpire for a game between the Dodgers and the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, in this game, he ejected the first base coach for the Dodgers, uh, Mariano Duncan, because he was complaining from the dugout about uh, what he felt were bad calls on checked swings right. for Luis Gonzalez and Chad Tracy. Uh, the manager came out and tried to argue the calls. Angel Hernandez, obviously, is not going to overturn any of his calls. Duncan okay. also came out, charged it, threw his hat at Angel Hernandez, uh, retreats back to it after being caught off by the crew chief. Angel Hernandez picked up the hat and threw it into the crowd. Um, kind of unprofessional. But the next yeah. night, Duncan came out with his hat taped to his head, which resulted in him getting suspended, even though, you know, Angel Hernandez was the jerk on that who made the wrong call uh, on that. And I'm a D-backs fan. They weren't checked swings. Right. <laughs> they, they went around. Ooh, we got a promoter. Cool. Yeah. And, and someone's reply to them. Wow. <laughs> um, 2011. The poll, Sports Illustrated, puts it out again. Angel Hernandez, once again, third worst umpire in Major League Baseball, according to players. And he's in that top percentage all the once time. Again, keeps oh his God. job. Still umpiring major games, uh, playoffs, division series. A Boston University study comes out uh, and finds that from 2008 to 2018, 
Angel Hernandez averaged 19 incorrect calls per game or 2.2 bad calls per inning wow. in every game that he's in. Per inning? Mm-hmm. That is crazy. Uh, one of those games with incorrect calls came on May 8th, 2013, where Angel Hernandez was a crew chief okay. uh, between a game uh, between the Oakland Athletics, the Oakland A's, and the Cleveland Indians. And this call came in the ninth inning, and it changed the outcome of the game, which Ooh. I hate. Yeah. Um, Adam Rosales hit a, a long ball that hit the first row of seats over the wall and bounced back on. Angel Hernandez ruled it a ground rule double, which is you can only take second base. It's not a sure. home run. Yeah. They challenged it. It was put up for video review. Him and two other umpires somehow came together and ruled it a double, even though it had hit above the wall and bounced yeah. back on. Bob Melvin, the A's manager, came on, got ejected from that one because <laughs> he wasn't able to convince him to reverse the call because it never ever, ever works that you're going to get him to reverse the call. Of course. Angel no. Hernandez or anybody else. No. Um, but ended up, uh, Adam Rosales was left stranded on base. They lost that game uh, just a little bit later. And what made it worse was that the Major League Baseball Vice President Joe Torrey came out and admitted that the following day, it was a home run, but the call is going to be allowed to stand because perfection is impossible to achieve for oh, umpires. Well, fuck off. Like, <laughs> I, I understand, like, and we'll get into it in a bit. You have to protect officials because they get a lot of hate in every sport. Yes. For sure. But surely the whole point of having them be respected and having them be you know, important to the game is to make them accountable for fuck ups that you can reverse. It happens in other sports. It happens. So in, in football soccer, there's been a big drive about respecting officials, but you know, if they underperform, they get removed. Um, I, I, I think of MMA, I think of the UFC, Steve Mazzagatti didn't stop a fight quick enough for Dana White's liking. And Steve Mazzagatti have been getting criticism for years for putting fighters in danger for not doing the right thing. And I hate the guy, but uh, Dana White said Steve Mazzagatti will never work in the UFC again. He endangered that fighter's life. And Mazzagatti was gone. He was exiled. And I kind of like that because at that point, it was like multiple mistakes from this guy who hadn't improved. If anything, he'd gotten worse. I don't understand how in almost every other industry and every other sport, people and uh, official points of power can be held to account or reprimanded. But baseball umpires seem to just carry on. They must have a great union. I I don't know what it is because it, it's from Little League and high school all the way up. It's it's the wow. joke. It's it just accepted that the calls are going to be bad and that's just the way it is. And people are going to argue it and get ejected. And the people are just going to stay being umpires. And I understand that, like, it's a tough job. It's hard. Yeah. Bang, bang, plays, right? Yeah. Life speed yeah. is hard. And you're on the road all the time. You know, it's probably not that well paid, I'd imagine. Uh, Angel Hernandez made somewhere around $500,000 a year. Okay, it's very well paid. Uh, yeah. So he's been doing that for 30 years. Holy shit. Okay, yeah. I take that back. We when he started out, he was making around nine hundred and fifty dollars a month, I believe it said. By okay. the time he made it to the major leagues, he was making like twelve hundred dollars uh, a week. That's not bad for the nineties. Yeah, that's good so money then it's yeah. not bad money. It's a, a well-paid job, and I think um, if you're not going to be good at it. You should at least be willing to um, try to, like... Yeah, be better. Yeah, you know? I guess that's... Like, if you're not going to be good at it, try to be better. I, I don't know. I mean, if you think about... Criticism, yeah. Uh, think about any CEO, you know, in the private sector. And, and they get a lot of criticism, rightly so. But when they underperform, they get fired. I mean, they have parachute payments, uh, packages. Maybe it's a few million dollars, whatever it is but they are fired and yeah. they're gone. Uh, maybe after a year, 
in the job, maybe a couple of years, maybe five years, they get fired for underperforming. They don't get to stay in a job where they earn hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to be really shit at their job on a high profile level. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, Angel Sorry. does. Angel does. For sure. Because in uh, during the 2016, 2017, and 2018 season, his calls at first base were overturned 14 out of 18 video reviews. Holy shit. That's a 78% overturn rate. That's terrible. Yeah, that that exceeds the 60% overturn rate for all first base calls by all umpires <laughs> during that period of time. Oh, my God. So. That's yeah. a lot of mistakes. Holy shit. And again. 2016 he's still only 43 he's our age yeah like i can I see feel, just fine i can see fine too i feel like and also i feel like if um i were like hey hey we're challenging this come over and look at this i'd be like oh shit you're right yeah yeah that's fair yeah i take it if you fuck yeah. up you take the mistake you own up to it he does not do that wow. no no he does Holy not shit. my god no and on July 3rd, 2017, uh, Angel filed a suit against Major League Baseball uh, about equal employment opportunity commissions arguing racial discrimination. Oh, get the fuck out of here, mate. Like, yeah, oh he was God. claiming that he didn't receive pre prestigious postseason umpiring assignments uh, or the opportunity to become a crew chief that he deserved because uh, of his race, even mm. though. He had high marks on his evaluations. Right. Does, yeah. Is he daring them to say it at this point? Well, he also Which cited his longstanding feud with the chief of baseball, Joe Torrey, going all the way back to Joe Torrey when he was a manager in baseball. Right. Okay. And he, he was saying, listen, before Joe showed up back in 2011, my evaluations were good. And then when he showed up, <laughs> uh, they, they got neutral or negative. And, okay. and, and so that's what it was. it was joe yeah yeah i don't believe and he's racist. that yeah, and he and he's racist mm -hmm. so so which which came first the the lowering of the things because of your race or because he felt that you were bad oh, oh it was because of the race thing oh so he didn't think you were a bad umpire no right, i don't know so why are you suing him <laughs> I don't know, but like a week later in uh, 2017 All-Star Game, he was selected as the first base umpire for that one. Oh, and then 2018, he was the American League Division Series uh, crew chief. So in a case of super bad timing, though, uh, Detroit Tigers second baseman in August of 2017, right after the, the lawsuit was filed, uh, ended up getting himself filed fine ten thousand dollars for coming out and saying that angel hernandez was a bad umpire who quote needs to find another job uh yeah but I he's agree. not wrong <laughs> he's but i mean not wrong bad timing uh right after you're getting sued oh, yeah. coming out and saying that uh, i guess so yeah um while the lawsuit's going on he's out there umpiring games october 8th 2018 he's the first base umpire for game three of the 2018 American League Division Series uh, against the Yankees versus the Red Sox. Four out of five plays he called at first base were submitted for video review and overturned. Oh, my God. That's yeah. really bad. This is in a playoff game. This is postseason baseball. This is important baseball. Yeah. The TBS analysts that were on uh, calling the game, quote, said, Angel was horrible. Don't get me going on Angel now. Major League Baseball needs to do something about Angel. It doesn't matter how many times he sues Major League Baseball. He's as bad as there is. Oh, my God. Did they get fined 10 grand for that? No, but the pitcher from the game said, I don't understand what he's doing in these games. He's always bad. He's a bad umpire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're um, speaking truth to power and getting fined for it. At this and point. Angel declined to comment after the game. The game was a blowout win for the Red Sox. Uh, MLB issued a statement. Uh, through a spokesperson who said there were several very close calls at first base tonight. We're mm. glad instant replay allowed the umpire crew uh, to achieve the proper result on all of them. <laughs> That's funny. Because Angel sucks. Because he's bad at his job. Yeah. Uh, during the investigation of a 20-minute 
delay during a game due to Angel's confusion over some new rules. Okay. Uh, they did an interview with him, and when his interview was over, he didn't hang up. He just kind of kept listening to the next interview of another umpire that okay. he knew was supposed to be separate. Okay. And because of that, Joe Torrey said, uh, we're taking away your your temporary crew chief assignment because we you can't be trusted. Well, um, yeah, he's effectively eavesdropping, right? Yes. So yeah. that's not good. Um, and then he had this to say about that. Uh, simply put, we find that you asserted justifications for remaining on the line to be implausible, internally inconsistent, premised on facts that were incorrect and not credible. We've concluded that you remained on the line in an effort to intentionally and deceptively eavesdrop on a confidential conversation in order to hear what Hickox would say, and this was an egregious offense. And then so he got his position taken away, and then he was also chastised for asking uh, Homer Bailey to sign 11 autographed baseballs after he pitched the no-hitter that Angel Hernandez called. Oh, dear. Mm. Um, Can you imagine finding out it, that your boss has been monitoring your private communications? That is really, really low. That would be bad. Like that if would you, be really bad. It would be horrible to find out your boss was monitoring your private email communications or like just listening Whatever in on other stuff. Forms. Yeah, just that'd be terrible. Shitty things. Anyway, so um, I lost where I was. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> So after he got his uh, crew chief title taken away for eavesdropping on the call for not understanding the rules and delaying a game sure. and wanting to hear what bad stuff this other umpire was going to say about him, um, <laughs> he got in trouble for then asking the pitcher of a game that he called who threw a no-hitter to sign some autographed baseballs for him uh, after he made three incorrect calls that were later overturned on the basis of video replay Jesus. in game three of that, that series there. Um, oh yeah. In that game, he was also shown angrily throwing his headset down after they overturned his calls. So <laughs> he's, he's a petulant motherfucker as well. Holy shit. Yeah. And then in 2001, the lawsuit finally comes to an end. It gets thrown out by a U.S district court judge with the mm -hmm. summary writing that the judge concludes that there's no reasonable juror could find that the MLB's stated explanation for the pretext. Anyway, yeah, there's no evidence to show that there was any sort of anything there. He just was bad at his job and they didn't want to give him a shot, but they ended up giving him a shot anyway because he sued him. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a weird moment where he is through his own arrogance shot himself in the foot there because we all knew what was going to happen with that court case that they were just going to come out and say no you're just really bad buddy and it's not racism i i am sure that there is racism at various levels in organized sport and possibly probably even baseball but i really don't think that applies in this situation i think you're just deluded and really bad at your job and somehow have earned millions of dollars doing it so yeah well, and then in the most recent case, two nights ago in Astros versus the Texas Rangers, uh, he, he called out three, three called strikes that were 6.78 inches or more outside the strike zone Holy on three shit. called strikes in a row to end a game. Uh, it was oh. probably one of the worst called games uh, in baseball, according to the, the everybody, and he still has a job and nobody cares. So, but he's not all bad. He's actually a pretty good guy. He's involved okay. in some charity work for disabled children and hosts a celebrity golf tournament. And okay. uh, he's just really bad at his job and probably should retire to some place in the woods and, and do something that's not calling not baseball. baseball games. <laughs> so I have a pitch for Angel Hernandez. Um, oh, do you? I he's going to call it. It's, it's a ball. <laughs> it's I am, I am telling you there is money here, and it is. I'm giving this to you, Angel, but it's based on the idea that you have to retire right now. Um, so, 
We have a, a brand in this country, uh, shops, opticians called Spec Savers. And there's a bunch of adverts, and it's usually people doing things and then realizing, oh, I've just put my baby in the microwave. Oh, dear, maybe <laughs> I should go to Spec Savers. You know, that sort of thing. Maybe not quite as dark as that, but always like quite funny. Um, I. Yeah, so one of them is uh, like a really romantic like guy living on a farm. It's black and white. He's shearing the sheep, and then he just grabs the nearest thing, and it's his dog, and the sheep dog's there with just like a bit of fur around the head, and then just a completely shorn body. Like, what the fuck, mate? Um, <laughs> so I think Angel Hernandez could make as much money from a marketing campaign such as that with a company whether it's an opticians, whether it's decision making, whether it's, uh, you know, using data to make sure that you get the right decision. I don't know. There is a brand out there that could be aligned with Angel Hernandez. And if he can drop his ego enough that he can look and go, I made a lot of mistakes in my career and somehow I kept my job for 30 fucking years, maybe there's an opportunity for him to make a lot of money on it. He could then transform that into a podcast and a book and a book tour and an audio book. Do this campaign, lean into the fact that you are only famous for being a screw up and you'll make a lot more money than you have done in your baseball career from it. It's like, so there's a, a program now on, um, Netflix. It's a it's a short film called Scoop. Okay. Um, don't know if you have it over there. It's definitely in the UK. If you have a VPN, come over to UK Netflix. Um, it's called Scoop, and it's Gillian Anderson's in it. Rufus Sewell. Uh, Gillian Anderson plays a BBC journalist called Emily Maitlis, and Rufus Sewell plays Prince Andrew. Okay. And it is the interview that Prince Andrew had on Newsnight where he was like, no, I wasn't with Jeffrey Epstein. No, I wasn't. We weren't that close friends. I only stayed <laughs> at his house eight times um, and stuff like, uh, were you also in a pizza express? And uh, she remembers this young woman remembers dancing with you and you were very sweaty. He said, well, it can't have been me because I have this very strange condition where I don't sweat because I overloaded on adrenaline in the Falklands war. And Emily made this is going, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> It's the ultimate car crash interview, television interview. It was seen around the world multiple times. The story is accurate in that going into it, Prince Andrew and his main advisor were under the illusion that he was really well liked in the country and that people were like, oh, you know, he's so personable and he's so... Uh, funny, and he's you know he's the popular kid, and everyone loves the kid's favorite kid, and and then like he gets in the room with a bunch of journalists, and they're like, listen, that's not the fucking, that's not what people think about you, and he was like, do I have a nickname? And he was like, and the main woman who's booked this interview is like, yeah, they call you Randy Andy because you're a playboy. Oh, and he's like, oh really? And she was like, I'm being polite. They call you much worse things on Twitter. And ah. then his daughter butts in, and she's like yeah, dad, they actually call you much worse things on Twitter. And he's like, right, I guess we'll do the interview then. And then he does this delusional interview and he thinks it's gone well. And his advisor goes, see, I told you he was really nice. And they're like, do you have any idea what's just happened? That was a fucking car crash and he looks like an idiot now. So Scoop is a story of someone who is incredibly privileged and completely detached from reality and who has been surrounded by people that insulate this world view of them to the point where they have no self-awareness of when they have completely ruined their lives i would highly recommend you go and watch scoop it's going to win a bunch of emmys this thing is brilliant Gillian anderson's amazing in it like she looks exactly like emily maitlis and she sounds like her as well it's, it's a great performance by everyone in it go and watch it um but that kind of reminds me of Angel Hernandez. He seems to be, and I, I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's just doing this to protect like his own self-image and maybe like his family and stuff. He doesn't sound like he has a lot of self-awareness. I don't I really don't know. Like mm. I just 
think that he thinks he's right. He just yeah. really thinks he's right all the Even time. Even though he's clearly not a lot yeah. of times. And actually, it's funny, when you mentioned Angel Hernandez, because we spoke about this before, and I guessed that it was Angel Hernandez, even though I don't know a lot about baseball. I love it, but don't know a lot about it. Um, I remember watching uh, a documentary on YouTube again, and I've mentioned this channel before. Baseball Doesn't Exist is the name okay. of the channel. They have okay. done a, um, a documentary on baseball umpires and how they get more calls wrong than just about any other official in any other sport, but somehow they keep their jobs and no one can get rid of them. And they mention Angel Hernandez a bunch in that documentary, as you can imagine, and point out that even though sometimes he was voted the worst umpire, technically he wasn't the worst, but he's certainly consistently one of the worst over a it's, long period of time. Like If there's somebody at your work that nobody likes working with, and is really shitty at their job. I'm kidding. It's not me. But go on. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I can't finish this now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Like, and they I have worked with those people. Last, though. Well, one person I know did. Yeah. Lasted a year. That's a way long longer time. than they should have done, and it was because they were friends with the person in charge. And the person in charge had a lot of patience and I bit my tongue a lot and I, I generally liked them. You know, they were a nice person like Angel Hernandez, nice guy, but should not be doing that job. Um, and 78% error that's rate. That's crazy. That is crazy. I can't imagine making that many errors in a job and keeping my job. Yeah. That's just insane. But what I will say, and this is something that's probably on the horizons. And I actually thought about writing a sci-fi story about this. There is going to come a point in time with generative AI and AI and technology and, and cameras and all of that. We are not going to need umpires at no. all. No, we are going to need someone to interpret the calls of the, technology on the field and around the field but we aren't going to need umpires to make calls i my theory for a sci-fi novel that started from an interesting premise and then maybe descended into chaos we don't need politicians anymore we can vote for anything any specific issue any local issue any regional issue any national issue we can do it on our phones yeah like what? american idol exactly why do we need politicians if there are people who in situations where they do not have access to a phone, you go to community spaces, post offices, you know, whatever it might be, and you install a standalone touchscreen where they can log in with their fingerprints, make their decision, go away. <laughs> and that's where the dystopian aspect comes in. Like, what if there's exploitation? What if you get into the manipulation of people through the media and like, oh, you should vote this way on this decision. And like, there are no intermediaries because politicians have gone. But is it a good or a bad thing? So like, that's the, the idea I had. Like, you couldn't argue both ways. But I certainly think when it comes to things like major sports, and we're starting to see it in soccer as well as a thing called VAR, which is very controversial and still not right. But were you seeing the implementation that, implementation of technology that is essentially getting rid of officials they aren't needed i i kind of like the the computerized officials type of thing because it's it's yeah. you have to play the game better <laughs> than yeah, exactly and it's instantaneous you know the yeah. rulings are instantaneous they're always accurate you can have humans on the pitch to break that uncanny valley like, oh my God, this machine is making decisions that are impacting my life and my performance. If you need someone there to be the face of the decision and say, hey, sorry, technology doesn't lie, then, you know, that's that's fine. But And, and also tradition in baseball is such a huge part of the sport. So, you know, keep those guys yeah. around to be the mouthpiece. But it, when you are working with a, a group of individuals that are as consistently incompetent and bad at their job as baseball umpires are allegedly, <laughs> then maybe you look to replace them um, with technology. How can you be that bad and not be taking a bribe? I think that the answer to that, Kimberly, is twofold. One, 
you just aren't very good at your job and you're not recognizing it. And two, institutional failings. Can you imagine if, I mean, he's not, and this is a bit of a stretch, I know, but can you imagine if Angel Hernandez was a doctor? Oh, my. I was thinking that, too. There'd be a lot of dead people. Imagine 78%. Imagine if he was a surgeon and he had a 78% success uh, failure rate on his yeah. surgeries. Uh, that's somebody who would be in prison now, right? That's oh, not yeah. someone who would be working in the same industry for 30 years. They'd be in prison for 30 years. So yeah. it's kind of amazing that baseball has buried its head in the sand over this for as long as it has. And I understand supporting officials and you need you know, hierarchies and they're, they're vulnerable and that's true. But there has to be a line in the sand where you say we can't deal with incompetence on this level anymore. Mm -hmm. I you agree. Know? Yeah. That's an interesting story. Now, as far as scoring goes, I want to give big props to Angel for being a good person away from baseball, from okay. what we can tell. You know, I think that's super important. He's got all of this pressure on him, and he probably gets a lot of abuse in public. Like, imagine oh, you go out with your wife and your kids to Quiznos, and some guy's like, you fucking useless piece of shit. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You imagine. I bet. He probably doesn't have the greatest life away from baseball, even though he's earning good money. Yeah, you know, five hundred thousand. He's losing half of that to tax. So it's very expensive traveling and stuff. But you know, he's making a decent living and has done for thirty years. It's probably time for to retire. But actually, because of the good stuff, I'm going to score him a little bit lower. He hasn't killed anyone, um, and um, he's probably just very arrogant and believes in himself too much, but I'm going to go with a 45 for Angel Hernandez. Okay. But I am going to go for a 50 for MLB. That's fair. Because <laughs> it's their fault. This is happening. Let's it not, is. You can say Joe Torre is against him all you want, and maybe it's true Joe Torre doesn't like him, but ultimately... They have never gotten to the stage where they have been like, we are going to hold officials accountable for their mistakes and actions. We're going to improve them. Listen, you don't have to punish them. Just like get them on a performance plan, you know, M maybe send them down to the miners, maybe have more training, maybe introduce technology so that you can enable them to be better at their jobs yeah. instead of like, just do all this stuff, help them. But if they keep going, don't let them go for decade after decade being useless at their job. There's somebody that wants that job that could do it better. Oh God. Can you imagine? There's someone out there with like amazing reaction speeds, really great eyesight, great calls, clarity of thought, and they would just, make great umpire. They're just stuck in the minor leagues. Exactly. And it, they, baseball is damaging its own brand by not moving forwards with this stuff. And that's the stupid thing. You're leaving money on the table and you're a fucking business. Stop doing that. <laughs> so love baseball would love to get involved in the culture a bit more. The idea of sitting down and watching something like that for hours at a time, like, yeah, fucking take my money. You know, <laughs> like I want to chill out as well and eat a hot dog, maybe in a gluten free bun. But you know, um, I love that idea, but like, come on. It's glaringly obvious to everyone. Why aren't you fixing it? You know, it feels like I'm back talking about wrestling again. All ah. the issues I had with WWE before very specific changes were made recently. So, um, yeah, Kimberly here. If it was a little league umpire, those dads would have thrashed him. That's happened, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Like, have Dude, some people of them been assaulted? Crazy. Yeah. And I, I remember watching, because I watched the outtakes, there was a, a, a little league umpire who was drunk and like falling over on the mound. Like, uh, like when he went over to talk to the pitcher or whatever, he's like stumbling over himself. Goodness. Whew. Yeah. Goodness. So uh, 45 for Angel Hernandez, a 50 for the uh, MLB. And um, William Henry Miller gets a 15, but the people of uh, the country that maybe said that he was possibly intersex or a vampire or a fairy get a 25 because <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? Uh, 
it's it might be the 19th century but you that's no excuse you have very ed, very good education standards at this time scotland you're better than this yeah so uh really interesting um so it, and the the weird thing is if you look at william henry miller i feel like he knew who he was i feel like he understood who he was he was like this is what i like this is who i am deal with it Angel Hernandez doesn't seem to be that guy. He seems to be the polar opposite of that. Yeah. He can't just be like, eh, I'm bad at my job, but I'm not getting any support, so why not look at MLB? Why haven't they implemented technology? They've got shitloads of money. You know? I tried to sue them. I've seen the books. I know how much money <laughs> they've got. <laughs> so, so that's our show. Another quite low-scoring one, but I really enjoyed the Angel Hernandez thing. I knew I was going to because he's such a fascinating character, but I kind of want him to do what I suggested. Take the endorsement from some brand where you lean into the fact that you're bad at your job, retire, and just live a quiet, happy life. And actually, I think if you do that, if you lean into the fact that you're good, people will kind of be all right with that. Like People oh, will be like, oh, it's the it. guy from the adverts who's like, Really bad. It's like that's fine. People aren't going to get really arsy about that. I think it. I think it diffuses a lot of the hate. Oh yeah, people will love it. Yeah. So I'm available for branding calls. Uh, <laughs> I charge twenty five hundred dollars an hour. No. Um. So yeah, Angel Hernandez and William Henry Miller. Really interesting episode this week. I had a lot of fun uh, researching William Henry Miller. Really interesting character. No one's really ever heard of him. But that mausoleum. Oh, I'm glad that you brought that up. And the so the fun. tour down the street and around the neighborhood yeah. was so much fun. Yeah, so and weird. actually, it it really was. And actually, that street specifically, because you might think, oh, you know, it's Edinburgh, it's the capital of Scotland. That could be any street in the UK. I like my wife and I went back to North Wales. We've driven through like hundreds of those streets in the last few days. Like it's it's a very common sight in the UK. However, not every street has a fifty fucking foot tall mausoleum with a potential <laughs> vampire buried underneath it. So you know, uh, there you that. go. Yeah. So thank you all so much for this. Um, we really enjoy doing these episodes for you. And if you would like to join our Patreon and maybe help us make this a full time gig. Go to patreon.com slash history's greatest idiots where you'll get access to behind the scenes looks into our lives. You'll get access to our scripts. You'll get free gifts for joining and also when you've been a, a Patreon for a year or even two years. And you'll also get access to exclusive uh, Patreon recordings that we do every single month and possibly a bunch of other features that we're adding in the future. We're, we're going to work on them in the background. Myself and Derek both work full time, so this is a side gig. But if you want to make this our full-time job, which would make me the happiest man in the world, me too. and Derek, <laughs> help us. I, I, we, I would love to do this full-time. I'd love to take this on the road, do it live. Oh, do it live! In front of an audience! Oh my god. Um, please join patreon.com slash history's greatest idiots. And if you want to follow us on Instagram, go to at history's greatest idiots. We're also at history's greatest idiots on YouTube, where you can watch a bunch of our previous recordings and videos on there and subscribe to us. I think we were up to 130 something. I can't remember. It's a it's a nice yeah. number. We're almost so. to 50,000 total players, too. We are. 50,000 all-time plays on Spotify. I'm super excited about that. Oh, I'm going to make a special video <laughs> or hire someone to make a special video uh, for a 50,000th download or play. Sorry, not downloads. Downloads are a different thing. Um, but thank you guys so much. Um, we will be back in a couple of weeks with another episode. I'm thinking of doing a Central Asian country. It might be our Ooh. first international body. As an okay. Idiot. Yeah, not the people, but the shit that's happened in that country. So interesting. Yeah, trust me, it's hilarious and horrifying in equal okay. measure. Yeah, as most things are in every country. Um, <laughs> but until then, Derek, would you like to say goodbye, please? Goodbye, everybody, and we will see you all again very, very soon. Take care.